I'd like to welcome everybody to the March Buckeye Valley Board of Education meeting. We get a roll call, please. Mr. Alboni? Yes. Mr. Dickey? Yes. Mrs. Scott? Yes. Mr. Jeffrey? Yes. Mrs. Scott? Yes. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We need a motion to approve the agenda. I move that the Buckeye Valley Board of Education approve the agenda as presented. I'll second. The late, there was one change that was somewhat late. Um, I think we got it added in on Monday, and that was a uh, the employment of Jennifer McCreary as a gifted intervention specialist for, their, for next school year. So you'll see that on the consent agenda. But that wasn't in, we first went out on Friday, but we added that in on Monday. Okay, so. Roll call. Mr. Alboni? Yes. Mr. Jakey? Yes. Mr. Dutt? Yes. Mr. Jeffrey? Yes. Mrs. Scout? Yes. I need a motion to approve the minutes. I move that the Buckeye Valley Board of Education approve the attached minutes upon the recommendation of the treasurer. I'll second. All right, roll call. Mr. Alboni? Yes. Mr. Dickey? Yes. Mrs. Dutt? Yes. Mr. Jeffrey? Yes. Mrs. Scout? Yes. Do we have any public comments on agenda items? I do not at this time. All right. We will move over to the district update. Okay. Um, we're going to, uh, you'll notice we didn't bring kids this time. So, but uh, I do think of these uh, next two, our next three individuals as young and cute still. So um, we've got our high school team. They're going to talk to us a little bit about our upcoming performing arts uh, uh, schedule for the spring. And then a little bit uh, uh, as we come to the end of the winter sports and start of spring sports, a little bit of an overview on, on uh, how our winter sports went. So, so uh, thank you all for the opportunity to kind of just go over a little update on um, our winter season for both our performing arts and our athletics. Um, we had a successful season, both athletics and with our performing arts um, department. Um, our students did really well, both on the court and on the stage and then in the classroom. So Mr. Music is going to start out and just go over um, our athletic updates. Sure. Thank you. Um, just to kind of give you a brief summary of our winter highlights. Um, congratulations, obviously, our, 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 our wrestling team was Mid-State League champions. Also, we had Coach of the Year, um, Brian Pete Wright. Did an excellent job for us, um, and just a tremendous season. We actually held a um, we had a duel uh, versus Highland during the school day, uh, and just you know we we have such a great interest with our student body with this and supportive. So it was a, a tremendous season. Uh, next, I just I have a couple pictures that I took at Jonathan Alder for our districts um, when I was over there a few weeks ago. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Ripley was also, uh, Ripley Zanotti um, was our eighth place finisher. Also, Landon Froelich was a, an, an alternate for the state, uh, for the state championships. Um, these guys right here, Hickson, um, Gentner, uh, Rosario, and uh, Billy, uh, they, these guys are all of our, uh, our first team award winners uh, for wrestling. Uh, this picture I took, well, actually our league hosts a, just to kind of let you know, every Sunday, or I should say every Sunday, um, a Sunday at the end of our season for the for our league championship, we actually, um, um, Whitehall host a league, um, record, record, or a league uh, I'm sorry, uh, banquet for our league. Um, it is awesome because we get to recognize in front of all three divisions, um, which is a uh, I got to get some good pictures here. Go ahead. Um, swim team, um, Alec and Allison uh, both qualified for the state championship held in Canton. Um, Alec ended up fin finishing 15th. Uh, I think it was 200 breaststroke, which was uh, 
Um, probably the high, one of the highest that we've ever had in our in our school history. Congratulations to them on a great season. Uh, another picture from this was uh, <coughs> in our sectionals. This took some good pictures here. Just wanted to share a few. Uh, bowling teams. Uh, Becca, she was our only first team award winner. Uh, Matlock, her also her mom is on our booster, uh, our secretary for our boosters, um, and uh, her husband actually works with. So we kind of work in room with Penn Lanes <coughs> here in Delaware, and uh, her husband actually helps manage uh, Penn Lanes. So, anyways, uh, Becca, she is a junior, and we uh, we do have high expectations for her next year. Uh, this was her up on the stage uh, at Whitehall for our Mid-State League uh, banquet. Also, cheerleading, Riley Devo, she was first team uh, for the 2023 season um, for our cheer competition. Uh, obviously, without their support, you know, uh, we, we couldn't do the things that we do. And she just a, uh, she was a, a great one. And we only, there was only five girls who made all league, and she was one of the five. That, you know, that includes Academy and Grandview, Bexley. And, um, so it's really, it's it's high level. And uh, congratulations to her. Just, I'm sorry, just sharing a couple of pictures that I had of our, our young ladies. Uh, Mr. Stolf for boys basketball. Uh, Brendan was, uh, had an excellent year as well. He uh, just, uh, Great student here, was nominated for the Agana Scholarship Af Scholar Athlete here in Central Ohio, and uh, just does a, it's been, had a great season. Uh, we're, we'll definitely miss him next year. As you can see here, Ella, she was our first team all MSL. She's a sophomore. She's, um, if you would ever see our girls play, she's the tallest one, uh, for, that's for sure. We finished 15 and eight. Um, Coming off of last year, a uh, humongous improvement. Finished third place in our league. Um, and, you know, like Worthington Christian in our league was number one in the state. So we lost to him by five here at our place. So uh, great season. Um, and uh, look forward to next year. We didn't have one senior this year. So 15 and 8 with all of our girls back. Um, we're looking forward to that. Um, <laughs> if you were able to attend, um, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, that, all the support we had for that day. Um, me and Mr. Riggs here were the cashiers for a while there. I, I did it till, till it closed, and we just uh, we kept it going. Um, you know, I don't uh, know if I kept my line going as fast as Mr. Music. Yeah, well, it's a great way to meet there. our community. And, um, you know, I found out there's a lot of good tippers in our <laughs> district. And they, uh, you know what, but... Uh, I think I think it was seventeen. I've heard of us. It was over seventeen thousand dollars we raised in you know about four and a half hours um, for for athletics and so so forth. With all of our silent auctions, uh, the youth basketball was it was a big hit. Um, I was getting a little worried because we weren't real busy busy at like say you know seven thirty eight o'clock, but like around nine ish ten ish, uh, we had a line going down the hallway. And uh, honestly, some of the, I was very surprised. I won't say surprised, but um, some of the donations we had was, uh, you know, Ken Sale could go golfing with a, 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 a four, with a, you know, four people can go golf with a, with a cart to, you know, someone donated $500 in, in gravel, $500 in mulch. And, uh, but that just speaks to our community and how supportive they are. So, and if I just took some, some random pictures of what our hallways looked like, um, and then we also, um, back in early February, we had our, our second national signing day. Um, and we had, uh, I think we had four signed to play football from Otterbein to Wittenberg. Um, we had a young lady signed to go to Finley to go play um, soccer. Um, and we had uh, a baseball uh, going to Lords. Uh, Teddy Akis went to play baseball. But uh, it turned out we had a great evening. Uh, we did it in the auditorium. We had our, um, uh, let's see, it's Evelyn. Does that sound right? Okay. Evelyn, I'm sorry. Evelyn, she, on the right here, she is going to Ohio Wesleyan to, to play tennis. And then our, um, our young lady on the left is going to Finley for soccer. So we, past week, we held our uh, spring band and choir concerts. Um, had great turnout for both of those events. Both of our groups did a wonderful job. 
Um, and luckily, we still have a few performances coming up. Um, show choir will be performing in school this Friday during Baron time, so all the student body will get the opportunity to see a snippet, snippet of their competition show. Um, and then we also have the cabaret silent auction and dessert and beverage buffet on April 8th at 7 p.m. in the auxiliary gym. So that'll be a great time um, to get out and see um, our various performing arts groups perform and, and you know bid on some silent auction items. And then finally, kind of our last big performing arts uh, event is the Spring Musical. This year they are doing the musical Freaky Friday. I don't know if you remember the Disney movie and the, the older version too, but that's going to take place on April 28th and 29th at 7 p.m. And then on April 30th, there's a matinee at 2 p.m. And tickets are $10 for students and $15 for adults. Um, and that'll tickets will be available on the website um, in April. So those are those are kind of a, a wrap up of our athletic and performing arts um, through the winter. So we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Music. Here. Oh, sorry. Could you say the name of the, the coach of the year again? Um, Brian Pete Wright. Brian Pete Wright. Yes. Yeah. For rest. Yeah. MSL coach of the year. Yep. That's it for the update. Thank you. Yep. All right, so I will move that the Buckeye Valley Board of Education approve the attached financial report at the recommendation of the treasurer. No second. Do you have anything you want to say? On that? Mr. Normal, huh? um, February reconciliation. I'm starting to get stuff together for the forecast um, that the board will approve again in May. Yes, it is. It's a it's a biannual budget year. So as you can imagine, it's just the emails are just flooding of possible scenarios that would be occurring for Buckeye Valley. So just staying calm and reviewing it and know that chances are that won't happen as of right now. So we won't know until June 30th at probably midnight what really is going to happen. <laughs> so anybody have any questions about anything? Not about these in particular, but when will you have the, the PI spending plan for the summer? Um, May. Yeah, within a month, probably. Okay. We're getting, um, we're just, the weather hopefully is breaking soon, so we'll get in, um, more of a better timeline for like the middle school playground that's going to be done, the tennis courts that are going to be done, um, <coughs> and then the paving for this whole campus. Oh, uh, mm -mm, we're going to start this paving in the spring. Okay, Frank, I'm looking at Jeremy because he does a better timeline than I do. Mm -hmm. What's it? Sorry, yes, yes. Paving, Gary Then we'll do the rest of the, the um, campus. It wasn't on your report. I just. No, because we weren't going to have it. Yeah, we yes. can ask you in April or May or April next month. Perfect. Yep. I'll get it together for you guys. All right, roll call. Mr. Albany? Yes. Mr. Dickey? Yes. Mr. Jeffrey? Yes. Mr. Scott? Mrs. Scouted? Yes. Yes. Oh, Mrs. Dustin, I apologize. Mr. All right, and I need a motion to approve the cons consent items. I so move. I'll second. second. Okay, I'll run through these very quickly. Uh, 5.2. Uh, is a classified sub addition to our list, and that's Chip Kidwell. And uh, if you recognize that name, that's because his mom works in our uh, food service. So, um, 5.3 is a classified employment transfer, and there's a slight rate change as part of that transfer. But that's uh, Nolan Martin, who's been a long time, uh, several years with us, moving from the middle school to the high school. And that's an opening that came up as our, our high school one of our high school custodians uh, got the head job at West. Uh, 5.4 is the, uh, the employment of uh, Jennifer McCurry as a gifted intervention specialist for the 2023-2024 school year for grades K through four. Uh, we wouldn't normally act on this. Jennifer has been a long time employee for us, uh, but I did want this to be on the board agenda because this is a new position. She may not be a new employee for us, but uh, 
this is one of the two new positions we see adding for this year that we had in the five-year forecast. Uh, it takes, it doubles the size of our gifted department. So <laughs> about 12% of our kids qualify for gifted in one way or another, and we've been serving those with one individual. So we'll now at least have a second that are helping to serve our, uh, our gifted kids. 5.5 are uh, supplementals, and this is uh, just picking up uh, some of the, uh, the last approvals uh, for our, our spring season. You see the uh, assistant track coach that we pulled last time just to make sure we had all the paperwork correct. We're now confident that we have all of that. And then two spring facility uh, managers. 5.6 is a resignation. Uh, Dylan Strauser, who has been with us uh, uh, for a while, um, accepted uh, other employment. Second shift custodian here at the high school. Uh, Amy Shunnerfield at the high school has been with us for a long time, and uh, she finally she made the decision that uh, this that this is going to be her final year. So we'll bring her back for the recognition uh, that we do in August. But uh, she did turn her paperwork in for uh, for retirement. And I had a chance to visit with her uh, earlier this week, and I think she's. Excited and, and uh, um, uh, feels comfortable with her choice, but uh, certainly going to be missed. 5.8 as uh, administrative contract renewal. Um, and this is for three of our uh, administrators. Our, all have been with us for several years. CC so Beth Cantner, which is probably a name many of you may not recognize as well, but Beth does our EMFs. Uh, that's one of those behind the scenes specialty roles that the district could not function without. So. She turns all of our power school data into EMIS data that goes to the state that manages all of our funding, all of our grade card, all of those kind of things. And she does a nice job. Uh, Brian Ornema um, uh, has been with us several years, so uh, recommending him for an extension. And Travis Rupp, who I think is our senior um, administrator on the team, recommending him for a uh, extension as well um, so it's good to have that uh, does he really okay very nice so um but uh it's good to have that experience on the team um one of the notes on there is that we will this will be in keeping with the buckeye valley administrative compensation plan uh which is something that we'll need to act on before the uh june 30th as a board so we'll move forward uh with that um the one change you see uh, is the title for Brian. Uh, he's been known as the Director of Academic Achievement. Uh, we're changing that to the Chief of Academic Affairs, and that's just to somewhat match more what what that position uh, is entitled kind of around Central Ohio. So that's usually either a Chief or an Assistant Superintendent. Um, but uh, in this case, uh, I thought it was appropriate to go with the Chief of Academic Affairs. 5.9 is a new bus route. This is a actually fairly small addition. Uh, this is a preschool student as we get through the year, we'll pick up some preschool students. This is a drop off of a preschool student um, that's being combined into a route that already exists, but it slightly changes the overall time for that route. 5.10 is uh, a fairly uh, big item. Uh, that's the, uh, the meta contracts and you, you see a master service agreement, you see the uh, uh, schedule one, uh, which is really our connectivity, and then you see our schedule two, which is some of the other support that we get from them, um, from kind of a menu of offerings that, that they have. Um, again, one of those things we could not run without in terms of getting our, our things to, to work together. Um, I did talk to the meta director this morning, by the way, about what you and I talked about um, just, and he's going to, uh, if you've tried to access um, PowerSchool on your phone, it actually works pretty well up until the time you try to look at your kid's report card. So um, I, I just put it into his ear and he actually has a, um, a meeting coming up with the, with the CEO okay. um, and, uh, and he's going to mention it to him as well. So just to get that, that uh, uh, higher up on their priority list. But, uh, all, none of these are, are really new. We haven't really changed anything about our meta contracts, nor have the costs really changed since the previous year. Uh, I get the sense that their last director was amazing. <laughs> That's why it's, it's running really well. Um, Is that your own opinion? I just, I've heard that. <laughs> yeah. um, all 
Um, the uh, uh, 5.11, the treasurer can probably talk a little bit more about this than, than I can, but this is the uh, Julian and uh, Groove uh, MSP. Correct. So um, um, our resources here provide um, Medicaid services to our students that are eligible for them. Um, and by doing so, we are able to get reimbursed back from the state for the services we provide to these students. Um, but in doing so, we have to be audited, just like my financials get audited in general. So this is, um, Julian Group is the auditing firm that will come in and audit to ensure that everything is being done properly. And this is a two-year contract. 1600 a year. Correct. Okay. Thank you. 5.12 is the recognition of the Council on International Educational Exchange as an organization that we will accept exchange students from. Uh, this would be, I think, our fourth organization. We have kind of a standing uh, practice that Rotary, our local Rotary, uh, is kind of our, uh, they, they kind of get first call on any seats that we might have for international exchange. Uh, but we'll normally have room for one or two more beyond what Rotary brings in. And CIEE just asked us to, to be recognized as one of the groups that could propose uh, bringing exchange students to us. <coughs> and then 5.13 is our 9 through 12 course guide for 2023-2024. Um, you'll see this hopefully earlier next year than you see it this year. And the only reason I say that is we're already into scheduling. And that's so um, it'd be nice to do, but we just had some catch up to do in, in terms of these kind of things. Uh, but we have the high school principal here to answer any questions that you might have. And, and Brian has a big piece of this as well as do our CIAs. Who are who are here so if you have any questions on this we've got the right people to answer those are you asking for approval tonight or just questions i am asking for approval, approval. yeah but, but you certainly can't ask questions before you make that decision um uh, just reading through there's nothing like red or striped through so i don't know what changed from before can anybody provide us a summary of the big changes yeah i can give you a highlight of some of the highlight but yeah so we really saw a big update to our English course offerings. Um, so we had an American Lit course that is now moving to 10 to align with American history at the 10th grade level. Um, and with that, we changed our junior and senior English course offerings to allow more choices. So they are now semesterized courses and students are able to select courses that better fit their interests. Um, some of the courses in there you'll see are film and literature, um, courses on college and career communication. Um, are all some of those additional courses that we that we kind of tweaked so that we have more offerings at the 11th and 12th grade level. Um, another big change in there was our science department um, added quite a few elective opportunities for students. Um, we wanted to make sure that students who are interested in science have a path to continue that into their after they take their you know their physical science, biology, chemistry. So there were some some new courses added in there like forensics, um, astronomy, anatomy. Um, were added in and then we also added a section there on a work study and career development class which was a big addition which you know is is very common amongst high schools we didn't necessarily have that program so we were implementing that for next year um, students will have that opportunity to get job experience and then also take the career development class um, to, to build some of those job skills so those were, those were the major changes were the additions to to those courses um, in there but as far as the uh, items on the first 10 pages or so, there were actually very few changes. In yeah, terms of we, we removed some things that were kind of doubled up. There were things in there that are also in our handbook. So we just, they didn't really have a place in a course guide. So since they were covered in the handbook, we removed those out of the course guide. Um, but generally it was just changes to the addition of courses. You also see we added a um, second adulting class. So we have adulting 101, we're now going to have adulting 102. Um, and so you'll see in there, kind of goes into a little more detail about what he's covering in, in each of those each of those courses. But that's been a really popular class. And so our students have been asking to kind of continue that on. So other opportunities for that. Is that where you rolled in financial, the financial literacy, or is that separate? So we actually do have a financial, financial. literacy course to meet that state graduation state requirement. requirement. Yeah. But he does cover finances does, within his course as well. Yeah, but it's covers, not it's not enough to yeah. cover the state requirements. He covers a lot of retirement, 401ks, those kind of things. Yeah. Um, financial literacy covers some of those state more state standards. 
for, for that graduation. Are all these taught by our teachers? Do we ever bring any outside speakers, realtors, investors, anything so, like that? So yeah, we have um, one of the courses in there, for example, our public safety course. Um, we have a teacher that, it, that oversees that class, but the, the course is really driven by um, EMS, um, members of our sheriff's department, fire department, they are all constantly coming in at different times and speaking speaking to those students. So that's just one example of where the teacher is, is part of the planning of that instruction, but has a lot of those resources um, doing, doing a lot of the instruction. Paul, did you ever find out about why weightlifting does not satisfy the PE requirement? I did, and Brian helped me uh, get the contact of the state and, and get the guidance on that. The, um, the state actually has a, a set of standards for PE, and it has a bunch of requirements for participation in team sports. So you really do have to run some of those things. Uh, they tightened it up, I think, several years back because there was this drift towards sports specific weightlifting yoga those kind of things i have to admit i was a part of that in, in a previous role because i think that has a place in terms of lifetime fitness but i get the sense the, the people at the state were traditional pe teachers who wanted to see all those things so they have limited what it is that you can grant that that pe credit for and so it's an elective pe credit but it cannot count towards that 0.5 um credit the, to, for your graduation requirement. So if I'm selected as the director of uh, education and workforce, we'll, uh, we'll fix that. So yeah. odds are not good since I don't apply to, don't plan on applying to be the director of education. And, workforce. and then the other question that I had that I discussed with you on Monday was about um, the GPA requirement for athletics and the state doesn't set a standard for that that leaves that to the school boards to set that standard. They just require, what, five? They require that you be five passing credits. five credits in the quarter prior to uh, the, the season. Uh, okay. And then when you have those blended seasons, you take another look uh, uh, during the season. So yeah, what that means is um, you could theoretically be eligible with a 0 0.67. And there are some some districts who have gone through that. Uh, what you see in front of you there is, um, I just went uh, based off the question from one of the board members and said, let me go look to see what other districts are doing. So you see the four Delaware County districts, us, Big Walnut, Delaware, and Olin Tangy. Um, you see a couple of the other mid-state league, Bexley and, and Grandview Heights specifically. And then Marysville, New Albany, Southwestern, Upper Arlington, Newark, and that was just kind of a survey, plus trying to get a couple of the the higher performing districts in there as well with Upper Arlington, New Albany, uh, and then a couple of districts that are more like us with Marysville and, and Newark. And what you see is we actually have the highest GPA requirement of anybody in Central Ohio, that 2.0. And because when you ask me that question, I'm like, yeah, that is low. Um, but um, you can, I mean, again, what you see is that most are even lower than that. Bexley is that 0 0.67. Um, Grandview Heights uh, is 1.67, and you see a few others that are 1.5s. You see a couple, Big Walnut and uh, Southwestern um, and New Albany, who use a gradated. So they'll start with a 1.5 for freshmen and a 1.75 for sophomores and or juniors, and then a 2.0 only for seniors, whereas we use a 2.0. The rest of our language is fairly similar, the two appeal windows during your high school career those kind of things. Um, Eric pulled the numbers for us on those kids that are between a 2 and a 2.5, just to kind of look at that. First off on the appeals, uh, Eric, you said we had one appeal this year. So only one kid who fell below that who, who used one of their appeals during the season. So the 2.0 isn't costing us a lot of kids is the sense that we have. Between 2 and 2.5 would be about 20% of our spring athletes. And so, um, and that was almost 200 kids, I think, if I remember yes. right, on the list that you had. Okay. So you're talking about 40 kids who fall between a 2 and a 2.5. Um, Did you lower that threshold at all to like 2.3 to see if that would affect less kids? 
You're asking me if I would lower it? No, did, did you by chance oh, run it? You no. just did it at 2.5? Okay. okay. I look for that. Uh, because as I look through here, yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be a, a competitive disadvantage for us to, to move above where we are. It's probably okay. a competitive disadvantage now to some extent. But the one thing that really occurred to me is what if we put some, a practice in the place for those kids who are between a 2 and 2.5? to basically require as part of your team participation study table kind of things study table and grade check kind of requirements so not ready to move on that now but i think this has, i appreciate the board member who asked the question and it certainly got us talking and thinking in, in terms of those kind of things so yeah you'll actually see our next board agenda and eric and uh, travis have been working on this uh is the um uh athletic i'm sorry the activity and yeah the activity handbook which will go into some more detail on this and, um, yeah and so that's and that's again an annual requirement that comes before you guys uh amy i'll get you a marked up copy of that i should have for, again I'm, I'm still learning as i go so i'll make sure you guys get a red line copy of that on one of our weekly updates before i bring it actually for approval so okay yeah uh, which i didn't do on this one and i apologize and will that, uh, we don't currently have any um, GPA requirement for extracurriculars outside of sports, do we? So, no, there is not necessarily a strict, but that is part of our activities handbook okay. that we've been working on is to address not only athletic, that's why we're moving from an athletic handbook to an activities handbook, is to address those other extracurricular activities that don't necessarily fall under OHSAA. So when that comes forward to you for approval next month, you're going to see that language in there. Good. Pretty good. I just want to see all of our, I want academics to be first and foremost. Obviously, I want our students to be well-rounded, but uh, academics, I feel like, is the key piece to that. And if we're lacking there, I don't care how great of an athlete you are, um, I want to see all the kids excelling educationally. So that was my sure. um, reasoning behind asking those questions. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm shocked that that there's schools in central Ohio that say you can play with a D minus uh, actually nonetheless. There were actually several others that Eric knew about as well. That yeah, it's, that's it's, wild. It's been, I mean, I've kind of seen the only most, I have not seen any school districts move up. I've seen them all go, go lower wow. to increase participation, maybe have a, provide an opportunity for someone to have a strong male or female role model in their life, provide an opportunity maybe, uh, but, that's, that's, that's the thing I have not seen it go rise. I just seen it decrease. So. Well, thanks for getting yeah. the information together. Sure. Does anybody else have any questions about the course guide for next year? Didn't compare it to the last one, but it looks like you captured all the new seals and simplified yeah. it. Yeah, on that, I believe it's the second or third page in there, fourth page there. Those are all those seals that we offer both the state and local seals. All right, if we don't have any more questions, we roll call. Mr. Laboni? Yes. Mr. Dickey? Yes. Mrs. Dutt? Yes. Mr. Jeffrey? Yes. Mrs. Scout? Yes. All right. And now the main reason that you all are here. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it straight over to uh, Brian to walk us through 6.1, 6.2, and 6.3. That's right. And for tonight, we're going to talk about 6.1 and 6.2 together. But when it's the actual vote, it'll be separate because it's the same company with two different products. So, so I'm going to give a quick overview before I turn it over to the team. But first of all, I want to... Put your hand up if you were part of the Committee for Social Studies or ELA, either one. So these are part of our teachers who were able to make it tonight, that were part of this process, and I'm very thankful to them and the CIAs and principals that were involved in this. This was not a Brian process, it was, it was something that was I helped lead, um, that was teacher-driven, um, so that we're doing the best for our kids. But for the ELA adoption, I, um, well first, process in general. I want you guys to know that tonight we're presenting to you for K through eight, the English language arts, and fifth grade academy to eighth grade social studies. We're giving you information tonight. 
We have some samples people can look at. As board members, tomorrow morning, you're going to get an email with the Board of Education Review Hub that has lots of links and info that you can dive into over the next month. And we also will have information in the Baron Buzz this week for families uh, in a section on our curriculum website with parent review hubs so that they can look through it over the next month. We'll also have hard copy materials. Middle school materials will be at the middle school and elementary materials at East and West. People can come in and look at some hard copy samples again over the next month and people can send questions and comments to myself. Um, we'll recommend approval in April. Yes. And that's, that's we'd really like to be able to stay on that timeline because that we'd love to get the materials ordered and into the hands of our teachers before the summer. So yes, um, I want to get training scheduled and all that good stuff. So. Um, but on the English language arts, which is the, the first presentation, there's a couple things I want to point out. I wanted to say this is, this is very exciting, but this is a big shift. So a lot of times in curriculum adoptions, you're updating the material, updating the text, maybe some new snazzy slides or, you know, um, teacher materials. But this is really a shift in terms of how we teach reading. And I'm proud of our work in this. I would say Buckeye Valley, compared to the average district in the state or the nation is probably a year or two ahead of where a lot of other districts are in this. So we're moving towards something called the science of reading. So over the past several years, there's been research that's really fleshed out what really helps a child learn how to read. And it's been a big shift because many of us went to college learning um, to teach reading the way that we've been doing it with small groups and level readers and all this good stuff. Um, and we love that format, and there's, there's a comfort to it. But we have found that it's not the best thing to do for a lot of our kids. Um, so it's time to change. And, and we've really grabbed the bull by the horn, um, and we're ready to dive into it. But it is a, it's not just a new material. It's a new way that our kids will be learning to read. Part of the first phase of it was when we received the 95% phonics material, which is a supplemental material uh, that we rolled out in January. We knew that we needed our kids to start being exposed to phonics right away. So we didn't want to wait for that. So we received that program and we purposely selected it because no matter which um, tier one program we went with, so tier one means what every kid gets. So no matter what program we chose, the program we said tonight, 95% would still work with it. It just might change a role. So that 95% phonics is going to still be something that we use it's going to end up becoming a resource that for students who are having a struggle and need extra support, that's the resources that they're going to be using. And it's very handy because all the teachers have training in it now, and we have materials for it, kindergarten up into the middle school. Um, this work of the program that we're presenting, um, it's from, it's, it's rooted Edie Hirsch, um, who has the Core Knowledge Foundation. Um, He's done a lot of work in education for several years, and I actually had the privilege in Virginia, where as a principal, um, we had a core knowledge school. Um, so I, I'm pretty intimate with his work. It was a pure core knowledge school, K through five. So his theory is that there are some common experiences, common lessons um, that as a nation, it's important that we have because it built a sense of belonging and who we are as Americans. So he's done a lot of work around that. The program that we're talking about tonight is from a company called Amplify, who's taken his work and they've consulted and they've packaged it into a program for reading for elementary students. But if you Google core knowledge, you're gonna get the pure E.D. Hirsch core knowledge curriculum by workbooks that support it, Barnes & Noble, and all that good stuff, but it's not directly what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about amplified core knowledge, language arts, which again is based on a lot of the themes that you see in his work, but it's not exactly the same. But I do have some of his, um, How to Educate a Citizen is a great book of his. Um, I have some extra copies if anyone would like it. And then his more recent book, American Ethnicity, uh, is also here. If you want to take a look at those, you can borrow those. Um, again, I talked about a big change. If, if you've had kids go through this system, 
you may have heard them talk about what level of books they're reading or they meet with kids on a similar level. This really starts to move away from that. And we're saying that we want all kids to be exposed to rigorous text at their grade level. And then the job is to give them support to be able to access that text. That by constantly lowering and putting a child on the level that they were on was keeping kids from excelling. And I will say there's part of us who've been doing leveled readers for years. They were like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. There's that kid with special needs. There's that English language learner. I don't know. I don't know. And we did site visits for these programs. We went to Heath, we went to Canton Local, and we went to Green Local. And we saw that it could be done. And we, the, what we heard kids reading, what we saw kindergartners writing, um, was very impressive. And the teachers all said that they went into it thinking, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know how my kindergartners going to do that, how my second graders going to do it. And they rose to the challenge, and the teachers were saying, they're doing it. They're doing it. Um, and I'm telling you, so that kindergarten writing up in Canton Local, not just the handwriting itself, which was great, but the writing, I was like, wow. I mean, there's something here. Uh, and our teachers will speak to that. Um, so I think I'm trying to see. So you'll hear the presentation. Hopefully, we'll get your vote um, in April. And then after that, we'll be really diving in and making sure the teachers have training in the program. We're going to offer some training sessions through the summer. Um, and then next year's uh, support when we have things like the late starts and half day professional developments, the elementary and middle school ELA teachers will have time dedicated diving into this work because it will be a lot of extra work for the first year. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Barb Dahl, who's our CIA, who takes the lead for uh, reading and writing in the elementary and her team. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Good evening. Thank you for having us here. Um, put me in front of 105th graders, and I'm phenomenal. <laughs> in front of adults, and I get a little nervous, so please bear with me. Um, First, I'd like to just recognize and thank um, our ELA committee members for their hard work, dedication, and professionalism. It was truly an honor to work with all of you throughout this process. We had a, high, a wide variety of educators represented who brought a wealth of knowledge and passion to the table. As a committee, we collectively and unanimously agree that Amplify CKLA and Amplify ELA best fit our district's vision and aligns with the with Ohio's plan to raise literacy and achievement. There we go. Okay, in 2017, Ohio State Literacy Team assembled to design and develop a working document to meet state, regional, and local needs for supporting language and literacy development. Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement is a cohesive literary framework aimed at promoting proficiency in reading, writing, and oral language for all learners through a science of reading or structured literacy approach. Ohio's literacy plan is grounded in the framework identified as the simple view of reading. This multiplication formula is based on the widely accepted view that reading includes two basic components, decoding or word level reading and language comprehension. One without the other will equal zero reading comprehension. The science of reading is a body of research that informs how proficient reading and writing develops. We know that reading is not innate. We are not born natural readers. Reading must be taught explicitly and systematically. Dr. Scarborough invented the concept of the reading room in the early 1900s to help parents and educators understand all of the various skills children need to become proficient readers. The two main sections, word recognition and language comprehension, are comprised of smaller strands. When woven together, these strands become the rope that represents skilled reading. All of the components are interconnected and inter inter interdependent. If just one strand is weak, it affects the rope and the reader as a whole. So I've got a little background knowledge for you about the science of reading and what we know um, students and children need in order to become that proficient skilled reader. So I'm gonna pass my microphone over to Angela Westlake, who is an intervention specialist at Buckeye Valley West and one of the members of our ELI committee. 
Thank you for having us here tonight. So um, at, thinking about Star Wars Rope and thinking about all the things that we know good readers, skilled readers need to know and have. As a committee, there were some specific things that we looked for when considering language arts programs. So some of the things that we looked for was we wanted it to be something that meets or exceeds expectations on ed reports and the Ohio Materials Matter. We also want it to be aligned both to Ohio State standards as well as to the science of reading. Um, we wanted a comprehensive tier one instruction, which is the instruction that classroom teachers provide for all students. We wanted to make sure that there is knowledge building, so students are learning, getting that background knowledge, having that important understanding so that they understand what they're reading. Um, we wanted to promote critical thinking. We wanted to give our students access to complex text, and we wanted it to be teacher friendly. So as you can see on the left, Amplify is um, recognized by Knowledge Matters campaign, as well as the Ed Reports um, information. So it, it has that knowledge component, the skills component together to hopefully help our readers become skilled readers. Um, so the next slide you'll see is how we take Scarborough's Rope that Barb talked about and where Amplify fits into that. So Amplify CKLA, which is the core knowledge language arts in K through 12 it kind of functions as two separate parts. We've got that language comprehension is addressed and the word recognition is addressed. By the time we get to grades three through five, those two are interwoven within the curriculum. And then grades six through eight, we have Amplify ELA, which is where we help our kids become more skilled readers as they put all those pieces together. <clears throat> So looking at our um, grades K through two, the, CKL, the Amplify CKLA, we have the skill strand, which focuses on foundational skills, such as phonological awareness and phonics. It has la language components like mechanics, conventions, spelling, vocabulary. We also have reading, which includes reading decodable text, also um, questions about the text, and written responses that relate to what they read which is really important that we have the reading and writing go hand in hand. Um, we also, Amplify CKLA also addresses writing, um, speaking and listening, and there's additional support for scaffolding, both as enrichment and students that need remediation, um, and there's an intervention toolkit provided. So as part of, that's part of the skill strand, which is where we look at the phonics and the um, word recognition. There's also the knowledge strand, which is where we see core connections um, there is knowledge gained in each grade that builds on itself. So as they move through this curriculum, there are specific things that will build. So the students are gaining that great knowledge. Um, there are also complex read-alouds that have rich vocabulary, visuals, and um, questions that are text-dependent. And then there's also an application component um, where students can collaborate and write. So moving from there, where we have the two separate parts, now in grades three through five, CKLA has it all combined into one, um, one big curriculum for those grades. And that includes the connections, which also is that prior knowledge. It includes reading of complex texts again, the writing, which is connected closely with reading, which is very important that those two are hand in hand. Um, so that's something that we really liked about this curriculum. The language also includes that grammar, morphology, spelling, some of those important um, skills that we, we want to make sure are included in this curriculum. It also included speaking and listening and la um, language skills. There are novel guides available. There are quests, which are um, project-based units. There are ebooks and audiobooks that can be used with technology. And um, there's also a partnership with ReadWorks, which can provide more of those rich texts that can be used in conjunction with this curriculum. So I'm going to pass it off to our CIA from East, Christine Anthony, and she's going to talk about grade six through eight. Thank you. So in six through eight, we kind of make a little bit of a change because we are no longer talking about um, those students who are learning. At this point, we're hoping we're leading them towards being skilled readers. So we're pushing through the process now of getting them to be able to apply and uh, utilize all of the work that they have done over the years. So in the six through eight component, they get, they're given both a digital and a paper option. They um, basically start from a hub that they get all of their work from, 
It's got personalized vocabulary apps, interactive grammar practice. Um, there's a digital library that has read alouds for anybody who might need it. So as part of that scaffolding and support of the end, there are also um, videos and uh, uh, dramatic readings that some of them are actually done by the authors to just kind of get the kids excited and into what it is that we're reading. Um, multimodal learning experiences. So we're talking about being able to hear the book and be able to visualize what is happening in Poe, and then they read the book, and what do they get out of the words that they're reading? We joked that then you smell the book, but that seemed a little strange. <laughs> um, so real-time differentiation strategies that are built into the program so that they're there for the teachers, they're not looking for something new. There's a robust assessment report so the teachers can actually go in and pull out how our students are doing on each skill that they're being taught, and then know where we need to do some support to help bring them farther along. Um, they have innovative assessment options, which actually means they have a system that grades the writing very much like the state does for our OST tests, which provides the kids with immediate feedback on what they're doing well in writing and what we need to continue working on. And then just like the, with the younger kids, there are some interactive quests. We're basically looking at anything we can that gets those kids interested and keeps them interested. And so that's what part of this program is actually focused on because it is written for middle school kids. So we've talked a lot about the different strands. This is actually the knowledge strand all laid out. So what this is, is starting in kindergarten, these are all the different topics for the units that the students will be taught. You can see that they travel all the way over to eighth grade, but the, the colored squares are showing us where the same topic might reappear. So for example, if you look at the five senses in kindergarten as part of our biology standard, they're going to see biology again in the human body in one way in first grade and in a completely different way in third grade. And then it's going to show up again once they get to sixth and seventh grade. We've got a whole history line that the one that what we have shown here for you is actually the beginnings and the growth of uh, the United States. So even starting in kindergarten, we're talking about colonial towns, then we're heading to the frontier, out to Western expansion, and we end up with the gold rush and the space race. One of the things we saw when we were in, the, when we did the visits, were how children, how the students were so interested in the topics. And some of these are topics that we look at as adults and think, really? They're gonna like this? But they were fascinated. And they could, they, we could ask them questions, they would tell us where the information came from, when we asked, how did you know that? Well, I read it. Of course, that was my answer. So we're gonna take just a couple minutes. We have a video for you that will just kind of let, let you get to know um, a little bit more about Camp The curriculums we had in place before we got CKLA were basically kind of scattered. I think we were just not meeting the needs of the kids. I think teachers felt frustrated within the classroom, always trying to supplement material. We also really, thought it was important to have something that continued to spiral throughout the year. Instead of teaching things in isolation, it's teaching a lot of different concepts at the same time. And when we came across CKLA, it wasn't presented with a big sales pitch. You know, there weren't a lot of bells and whistles. It was just pretty straightforward. Here's a program that can address, you know, foundational skills. It's got a content knowledge and it's going to work for your EL students as well. I think the bottom line is after all the years of seeing language arts programs that are very similar, this has been a huge change. Their support in, in helping us out in training our teachers and making sure that the curriculum was used appropriately was just second to none. I, I was really doubtful in the beginning. As a teacher, it was terrifying. I thought, how is this going to work? They say that it will. I can see that it might, but I'm not sure. I felt like we, we underestimated our kids. Um, Amplify does hold a lot of rigor. And we, for a second, when we started this program, we felt the kids were not going to be able to meet those expectations and they have, they surpassed it, and we are seeing tremendous amounts of growth. They are reading things that 
typically we wouldn't be reading this early in the year. Very good. The sound is ow. Everyone say ow. ow. The introduction of the sounds follows a very different sequence than any other program I have used in the past. The kids seem to be picking it up more quickly. When a man went up. Major differences that I am seeing are the ability of my students to communicate to each other. Hello fellow classmates, I'm up here today to talk about the invention of the clock. The inclusion of the knowledge piece is so important and I think that's the one thing that we're really finding the payoff. Kids are reading about something and they're responding and the responses that they're writing are you know, head and shoulders above where they were before. My favorite part is the knowledge piece because of the storytelling, because of the interest. Later, Montezuma and his chief advisors met together. Can you see the strangers? Yeah. <gasps> oh, shoot. I like that the kids are learning things that I wouldn't have thought to teach to a first grader. We're also going to hear this word. Today. Retreat. retreat. This is the word retreat. Core knowledge, it, it helped bring the learning alive in learning the language components. It wasn't just rote skills of grammar or vocabulary. It was actually tied to something that was, you know, worldly or meant something in their lives. What is a pitch? Alan. There's a good pitch and a bad pitch. If a good pitch is like many facts, well-organized, informative. They're learning about lords and serfs and, and they were comparing and contrasting without even knowing that they were comparing and contrasting. What I like about CKLA is that we get to learn about all the inventors and do research on them. It was basically science and experiments and history. It all in one bundle, it's really cool. It's a lot more fun this year with CKLA. Okay, guys, welcome back to today's episode of Eureka! As a teacher, I have learned a lot from CKLA. There are times when I'm looking at a lesson and I will kind of look and think, that's amazing. The way that they were able to teach that specific skill in many ways was ingenious. The map that they have is unparalleled. So is there a specific subtitle that would have that information? Yeah. Which one? It would have to be We certainly like to see the, the way the program spirals throughout the year within a grade level. Uh, the, the spiraling between grade levels is really neat. Uh, the fact that kids are going to see something in first grade and third grade and fifth grade, it's just going to reinforce their love for learning it. Lots of times the bell will ring and they want to continue, just let us finish, just let us finish, give us five more minutes. When you have an English language arts curriculum that compete with recess, that's a huge deal. Yeah, it goes by very quickly because a lot of people say that whenever the time flies, whenever you're having fun. And I'm having a lot of fun, so time flies real fast. I think what's making me most proud as the principal is that it's giving the teachers the tools that they need to be effective in the classroom. But at the same time, it doesn't take away their opportunity to keep teaching art. I had spent 12 hours a day trying to come up with curriculum and the Amplify has all these pieces already there for you. Are you ready to do some chaining? Yeah! That allowed me to focus in on all the fun stuff. Excellent use of text evidence. I love it. I would highly recommend this program to any school, just being that you see the building of the confidence within kids. It meets the needs of the social economically disadvantaged kids. It meets the needs of EL kids. It meets the needs of all kids. When you're doing something new and it's effective, then that's why you changed. It's been the best year that I've ever done because of CKLA. This class is awesome. It's funny because one of the things that I'm noticing in that video was student engagement. I know when we went on our um, our site visits, that was one of the things that I made. So since Jen just left, I wanted her to speak to this. But we literally walked into a classroom where a student, you can tell right off the bat, the student the push buttons and try to get away with things like we walked in and started counting all of us. And as soon as the teacher assigned him to go sit and, and read independently, he was in his seat, he was on task. The engagement was all inspiring when we went to these different places. Um, we Students finished reading a passage and while they were waiting for the teacher to instruct them um, on what to do next, they naturally began having a conversation 
comparing and contrasting soccer today with soccer long ago. Like, there, it was inspiring. We walked into a third grade classroom. Every student was able to read just about every word on the page. Like, it was, it was really incredible to see. So I just wanted to speak to that. Sorry. And I think that was one of the other things that I thought about while watching that was when we were visiting one of the schools, we went into a kindergarten classroom and the curriculum director was with us and said, if you had shown me the list of the teachers you were going to see last year and her name was on it, I would have been embarrassed. But CKLA is not only good for our kids, it's good for our teachers. My teachers have actually grown and become better teachers with the use of this program. So at this point, we, this is what we have to share with you. Do you have any questions? Um, the question that I have is, um, how is this curriculum going to transition from where our kids currently are? Are they going to say a seventh grader, are they going to be able to go right into this seemingly fairly advanced eighth grade ELA? We had talked a little bit about that with people that we went on a site visit with, and we were concerned about the same things. And there definitely is a learning curve. Um, but I feel, I feel like in the fourth and fifth grade classrooms, at least, we got to go into, it wasn't so incredibly shocking or striking. It wasn't that the kids, like, it took a little bit more work, but they were able to do the work. And if anything, the teachers said they were impressed with what the kids were able to do, the rigor they were able to have, handle the challenge that they were able to, you know, things that maybe the teachers expected to be more of a struggle, you know, through using this program, they were able to rise to it a lot of the time. And I attended the middle school site visit to explain, like, maybe that transition in the middle grades at that later end of growth. Um, and this was, sorry, and this was coming out of uh, a district that had had no provided curriculum for 20 years. And teachers were doing a lot of different things. Um, and they said that within maybe the first quarter of kids adjusting to the concept of writing and looking at those knowledge components, they were seeing massive gains between a kid's seventh grade to their eighth grade year. And that with Amplify, there's an acclimation kind of launch unit so that kids are learning how to follow along the structure of that unit. Um, and by the time we saw them there in like third quarter, they were, you couldn't even tell it was like really their first year. And I'll, I'll also say that um, <coughs> if we didn't have that 95% materials integrity, um, I would feel less confident just because that's helped give them, uh, give them a, a base to start with this semester. And all teachers, including middle school teachers, will have that as a resource for the next several years. Because our kids, especially fourth and up, haven't had some of these uh, phonemic, uh, phonemic awareness and phonic skills that they really uh, would have with this program. So the fact that those teachers have been trained in that and have resources to, for small group, um, I feel confident we can help get them supported. Does this Amplify offer a phonics element yes. that we could phase out? I, I know we recently went. I think January we went with the 95%, but we'll keep, so, we'll keep 95%. percent right. the vigilant is really thing as our, our supplement and as our tier two okay. intervention. So they'll, we'll still get yeah. great use yeah. for that for years. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. I had one. Would it, would it be possible? Like, is there flexibility within the program, like for the six to eight, to maybe talk with like our social and science teachers and have some of the writing pieces align better with the curriculum maps? Like I just saw in there, like the sixth grade, the Greek one should certainly be in seventh. Like it would make more yeah. sense to do seventh grade because then you could have a true for this. Is there flexibility there for some of those pieces? Absolutely. There's some flexibility, but I will say that when I talked with some of the curriculum directors, they struggled with, with that piece, but they said it's, it's helped the social studies teachers because the kids have had exposure to it if through their literature, the, even if it was the year prior. So... That's one thing that you're you're always gonna have to play with a little bit on because the the you know, the pure core knowledge foundation was not based on any state standards at all. So they are out of sequence. Um, so it's figuring out, but but again, the consensus seemed to be that hey, it's actually awesome that my kids are getting some of that prior background knowledge and I'm not the first one loading them um, with that knowledge. 
but there is a the goal with the uh, middle school, especially as we grow the academy, is there are more of those cross curricular um, writing opportunities. Do they have a curriculum that goes into high school? They do not. No. Okay. But I will. I. I, I will say that the work we've done this year to realign some of our ELA work at the high school um, was very was done intentionally to try to again better connect social studies and ELA. And as long as we stay on that, I I don't want our kids to go through four years of this, get to high school, and then be bored in yeah. high school English because they've had this seemingly great program Absolutely. to go through. Absolutely. Right, yeah, we I still need to get through the social studies and we're coming yeah, up we in do. about 10 I minutes. Know. So Jen, you got the... Uh... I have one question. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so surprised nobody asked, but price, how is it different? So I don't have the, they're working on the quote now, but this, I mean, this isn't a cheap thing. Um, but, you know, I, don't, I know I don't need to say this, but the investment in our kids being strong readers, I think, is one of our top um, responsibilities here. So I think it's an investment yes. worth. Kelly, um, this comes out of permanent improvement? Yes. Mm -hmm. Except so. for the professional development, it comes out of permanent improvement. And last year we were light using that, and I know to Kelly that doesn't matter. But um, <laughs> and next year will be a little lighter. But All right, so briefly segmenting to social studies, a couple quick things I wanted to say. First of all, with ELA, though, the last thing I'll say is. Teachers are very strongly opinionated about teaching reading, as they should be. So the fact that we have a unanimous vote and I did not vote is a that's miraculous. I'm just saying that. Um, all right, social studies. Real quick, um, I want to note that originally it was a K through 12 social studies uh, curriculum adoption. It's rare to do two in a year. Maybe I was crazy to do both. We'll see. Um, K through five, we did pause for a year. We're going to pick that back up next year because there's going to be so many changes next year with the dyslexia laws and this curriculum. It was just more, it would not be fair um, to the teachers or to the kids or, or anyone to put through both of those programs. But you will see when Jen, um, well, I will point out that this program covers a lot of science and social studies. So we're going to be starting the work of getting that work more integrated with this adoption. Jen will be talking about the, the fifth grade academy and eighth grade um, social studies tonight. Next month, you'll hear similar to what you did tonight about the nine through 12 social studies adoption. We're just about a month behind on that. And we only had so much time tonight, too. So, with no delay, here's Jen Page. She is social, social studies guru. I don't know if guru is uh, the key word here, but yet. Uh, my name is Jen Page. I'm the CIA specialist in charge of 6 through 12 social studies and language arts. Um, I was previously a middle school social studies teacher for about 14 years before transitioning into this role at Buckeye Valley. So I was beyond excited to have a chance to bring you know, social studies to the forefront to you guys tonight. It is my passion and I'm excited to share with you today um, our recommendation for 5th grade academy and then 6 through 8. And I been encouraged to make a joke about the Ides of March. I just hope my speech goes better than uh, Caesar's did. So, um, so uh, this is our committee right here. Um, this includes all of the members from K through 12, um, and then specifically the folks tonight who did a lot of work around middle grades. Um, I really would like to thank them. There's quite a few of them in the audience here today. Thank you so much. Um, it has been a pleasure working with such passionate teachers about social studies. Um, especially sharing that myself. Okay, so why was the committee formed? Number one, last year all the curriculum specialists did a curriculum inventory across all subjects and grade levels for the district. And that illustrated a compelling need for social studies. And last year we identified social studies as the predominant need for a curriculum adoption this year. Um, there was a lack of district-provided resources in K through three. Um, and when you get this presentation tomorrow, you'll be able to click and, and see these actual embedded links here as well. There were out-of-date grades 5 through 8 textbooks and uh, defunct and or expiring online products. So, for example, our old middle school social studies text had a lot of flash embedded um, products and flash doesn't work any longer. Okay? Um, their current materials were ineffective for blended learning and working with one-to-one -one Chromebooks and Schoology, etc. Teachers expressed 
a desire for high quality, um, engaging resources, and current materials did not really support inquiry and social studies skills instruction. So our committee process started by launching the adoption committee um, early this winter, and we discussed the state of social studies in Buckeye Valley. We shared research on the marginalization of social studies across our country, and we discussed some non-negotiable uh, needs for social studies material adoption. We then transitioned into developing a vision and purpose, and we generated descriptors of what quality social studies instruction needed to look like here in Buckeye Valley. And we developed then a material review rubric to evaluate curriculum resources with our vision in mind. So unlike ELA or math and their ability to use Edward Ports for Ohio Materials Matter, there is no larger, big, third-party curriculum reviewer that has a wonderfully adopted broad rubric for social studies because social studies is very state-specific in regards to the standards that are taught. We then transitioned into evaluating high-quality instructional materials. And in this phase, teachers worked to review specific resources, both digital and print. They completed rubrics, and they viewed presentations from the publishers and had lots of great discussion around the attributes of what they looked at. This slide has a bunch of linked pieces of research that are just really things that I believe strongly about. Um, and what we can see here that it really goes hand in hand with a lot of what you heard about the science of reading and knowledge matters. Because essentially, knowledge matters, specifically social studies. 55.4% of the academic vocabulary that a student needs comes out of social studies. On this slide, I've linked several key studies and collectively, they illustrate that the quality social studies instruction matters, and also that it is often the most marginalized of the core academic subjects. Sadly, the unintended consequence of high stakes testing in ELA and math, that for decades now, social studies instruction, especially in the elementary grades, has been underserved at best, and at worst, omitted, as districts across the country sought to improve reading test scores. Increased amounts of instructional time and professional development have been devoted to English language arts and math in a quest to raise test scores. Where were those resources borrowed from? Social studies and science. This is not just a Buckeye Valley problem. It is a national problem, but one that we are seeking to address locally with both our ELA and our social studies adoptions in Buckeye Valley. Social studies and science provide some of the most engaging and compelling content to learn about. Current research states that increased time in social studies, more than ELA, has a greater impact on improving reading comprehension. We are excited about how Amplify CKLA and Amplify ELA will make strong connections between ELA and social studies and science. In providing high quality middle school social studies programs, we can ensure that Buckeye Valley students not only excel academically, but are prepared to serve their communities as responsible and engaged citizens. So here we have really the key areas of what students learn in Ohio's vertical articulation for social studies in grades five through eight. Fifth and sixth grade are kind of a, a place where Ohio is different than a lot of different states, where we have a focus on geography in fifth and sixth grade by hemisphere. And within that geography focus, there is an early cultures and early civilizations piece. So in fifth grade, we're looking at the Western hemisphere, North and South America, and early civs in North and South America. And then in sixth grade, we're going to look at the Eastern Hemisphere and then some early river civilizations there. In seventh grade, we have uh, ancient world history starting with ancient Greece up through the first global age. And then in eighth grade, which is again a pretty more consistent across the country, an early US history course that takes us from exploration up through reconstruction after the Civil War. Okay, so in Buckeye Valley, we believe that social studies instruction should Inspire reading, writing, speaking, and listening, and critical thinking. Connect to students' lives and their interests. Include multiple ways for students to present what they know. Provide opportunities for students to engage in cooperative learning. Be engaging and fun in order to build student passion and understanding. Encourage active, informed, and responsible citizenship. Teach students to find and utilize reliable sources and be standards aligned and inquiry based. To suppose that we have a problem in social studies is not to say that we aren't doing great things in Buckeye Valley for in social studies. And I wanted to highlight a few things here. In seventh grade, we have students making an argument over what's the superior city, state, Athens, or Sparta. 
We had students doing a card sort, looking at the text of the Bill of Rights, connecting what those rights and freedoms meant for Americans. We had students doing a, uh, a human timeline in Ms. Heston's class where they were really trying to understand the difference between BCE, CE, AD, and they, they, they really get confused on, the, on those dates. And so she did everything in a human timeline, and kids were morphing around trying to figure out where they belong. Uh, in Mr. Krejcik's class last year, students were doing a fun review on the American Revolution by creating memes to show what they know. In Mr. Sharp's social studies classroom, he recreates the mall at Washington, D.C. before the eighth graders go on the D.C. trip so they get this like immersive experience in the classroom before they actually go to D.C. In seventh grade social studies this year, when Ms. Standish and Ms. Dye are really focusing on thinking like a historian, they got looking at primary sources and corroborating evidence. We've got uh, blackout poetry with the uh, Declaration of Independence. And of course, Mr. Sharp's super cool. He loves to dress up and bring in all sorts of things to get kids excited. And this was a lesson I saw from Ms. Heston in the library where kids were doing archaeology with a chocolate chip cookie. And then they were climbing down into the caves to explore cave paintings. And these are all things that are going to be everyday occurrences with the program that we're recommending. So teachers needed high quality instructional materials that integrate with Schoology and Classlink, that supported professional collaboration, that fit the needs of a classroom in the 21st century. That includes meaningful primary sources, which is essentially key to our, um, our ancient world history, which finds a little bit more trouble in finding those materials translated for students. It includes accurate information, ensures access to quality lesson experiences for all students, supports differentiation with scaffolds and enrichment, and supports curriculum work and PC and standards. And from what all we looked at, the gold standard really became TCI or History Alive. Um, and that is our recommendation. These are the other programs that we took a look at. Um, and you can see some different grade levels here, but right now it's, uh, we're focusing on TCI as our middle grades. And I've got a quick video, uh, it's about a minute, and then we'll take a look at the key elements. <laughs> This is TCI, the creators of award-winning online social studies curriculum, revolutionizing classrooms across the country. Who's going to be my first group to go in their archaeology day? In a TCI classroom, lessons are hands-on, student-led, and inquiry-based. The curriculum makes it simple for students to interact with social studies in groups and independently, lead activities, and master key social studies concepts. Today we're going to be astronauts. Are you guys ready? Yeah. In a TCI classroom, you'll find students taking off into space to learn about geography, replicating the American Revolution through a game of tug of war, simulating a feudal society, or examining and discussing primary sources. I think they're rebelling. Yeah, they're rebelling. Yeah, they're rebelling. TCI uses the latest technologies to maximize student engagement and learning both in the classroom as well as at home. It was created by teachers for teachers. Three, two, one, go! Yeah. Oh. TCI creates a learning environment that students want to be a part of. This is the next evolution of in-classroom social studies curriculum. It will revolutionize your classroom. Um, and when you take a look at the reviewer materials, sometimes for a social studies provider, because they have a lot of different courses that they support, these are the four programs that you would be looking at. Um, in sixth grade, the ancient world, uh, in seventh grade, the world through 1750, and there's some overlap in the text there, so not every single chapter between those two are used in both grade levels. And then U.S. through industrialism, so the final chapters in that book wouldn't be needed for eighth grade. Um, fifth grade is Ohio-specific digital product that they put together to meet that geography component needs in the ancient six piece. Um, whenever you get this presentation, you'll we'll also be able to click the standards correlations and see that. So we picked TCI because it did everything and met, uh, checked every box that we were looking for in what we wanted for social studies instruction. Live PD for teachers, it's inquiry-based, standards aligned, that engaging component of kids bringing history to life 
differentiated learning opportunities. It's flexible, blended program for the 21st century. DCI is also a leading program in some states that have some really um, rigorous adoption protocols. Um, and it also integrates literacy and promotes citizenship. So I couldn't be happier to recommend this as an opportunity for students. Um, I'll just leave you with thank you for your time. And here are some words from our teachers that what they're excited about for next year. Are there any questions? At the beginning of your presentation, you said that the committee um, discussed the non-negotiable needs for social studies. What were those non-negotiables? Do you remember? Number one, every teacher expressed a need for um, primary source materials. Um, in learning how to do history and vet sources, they want kids being able to access um, those documents and be able to compare them with secondary sources so that kids can um, construct arguments about the past, which is what historians do. One of the things that we really noticed is that oftentimes in science, kids understand what it is to be a scientist. They do science. But very often in many history classrooms, they don't have the opportunity to do history, which is being a detective about the past. Um, the other key element was that we wanted a material, especially in middle grades, that was going to be able to fit for a teacher who maybe has some transience in teaching that subject. And what I mean is, in the middle school, when we have changing enrollments between grade levels, we often see a teacher who changes subjects and or changes grade levels fairly often. And so, for example, in sixth grade this year, we have four people teaching sixth grade social studies. One, Ms. Heston, who is there um, teaching social studies the whole day, but the other four, or the other three people, teach one teaches three preps of math and then one social studies. Someone else teaches three ELAs and a social studies. And so the time and ability to invest in having a common experience for students is somewhat lacking. And this having this program to back teachers is a key part. Thank you. Thank you. And obviously we're still waiting on the quote for the cost of this curriculum as well. I do want, yeah, I do want to mention um, the governor's budget does have money specifically for the science of reading purchase. So, I mean, it's going to be hundreds of thousands. I don't, I'm not, you know, but at least on the ELA, it looks like we, we're going to get a significant portion of that back from the governor's budget because he's made, he's actually mandating science of reading um, aligned materials and basically prohibiting the old Balance literacy, Lucy Calkins, even reading recovery as a, as a, a mode of, of intervention. So, um, we, at least for the English language arts, we're never going to see this. But yeah, this this is one of those major expenses out of our our uh, uh, permanent improvement budget. That's why we have that you know part of why we have that permanent improvement there for the acquisition of, of these major materials that would be tough out of a uh, operating budget. Um, I have another question too. So, so this is just for the fifth grade academy and then six through eight. Are our fifth graders that are at the elementary schools, are they going to receive an entirely different social studies? They're gonna continue using, the K through five is gonna continue using what we have, but it doesn't have the explicit connections. I think what you'll see when we do our K through five adoption, you notice that it was social studies alive versus history alive. Mm -hmm. That'll be kind of, one of the decisions that K through five makes is do they then align all of our K five into that one as well? But this year going, we needed the specific connections as part of what we were promising for the academy. So that's why we're grabbing the fifth grade portion of this for the academy kids. So at least for one year, we will have a different curriculum, which wasn't in my vision for the, but we also thought we were gonna do a K through five. Yeah. Social studies adoption, we decided to postpone that just because of bandwidth with the dyslexia and the ELA adoption having such an impact on our K through five teachers. So yeah, we're sort of using it as a pilot. Yeah. We're using it as a pilot okay. grade as well. Yeah. And Brian, do you get the sense from the teachers that um, you all have enough time to familiarize yourself with this curriculum, enough time to implement it? Um, and then come out full swing in August uh, teaching the kids. Yeah, that's why we delayed the K through five social studies. Uh, uh, in addition to supporting the academy, one reason we're doing this in fifth grade is the fifth grade social studies teacher will only be teaching social studies so they can get yes. yeah. full in depth training on this. 
for the elementary teachers are going to get their full depth on the uh, core knowledge piece. So okay. I'm confident um, it's tight, like we've talked about. There's um, a lot going on, but uh, I'm confident it will work out and it supports each other, which is nice. There's not something that's completely unconnected. Now, Brian, we'll have a feedback mechanism that will basically be the, you know, uh, the public having a chance to reach out to you with any questions. Yes. Board being able to reach out to you and to, to me uh, with any questions that they have between now and the April meeting. One of the things the board president asked was, do we need a special meeting, a work session for this? And I think what we do is hold that call until we see how much feedback we're, we're receiving. If it's fairly light, which it normally is, I think. You know, we probably can handle that within the regular board meeting in April. If it starts to be a little bit more, you know, where we think we're really going to have to dig into it, perhaps, you know, we get together and schedule a work session to, to go over it. Um, I've heard a lot of great positives. Is there any concerns that staff has expressed with this curriculum? Well, I think, even to your question, just um, making sure that to help support the kids in the transition to a more rigorous curriculum where they're not level. Um, just again, also, um, it's, it's hard sometimes we need to put our faith in this program. And this is a very research based program. That's a lot of evidence behind how it works. Um, and everyone we spoke with outside of the company, I'm talking about other teachers and curriculum directors are like, you gotta dive in. We need to trust the program and trust the process. And that's always hard for any of us to do, right? Like, man, I, I would think I would teach syllables this way. It's sort of doing a different path. Let's trust in it and see what the data and numbers show, because this has been a program that's been nationally researched, um, and there's a lot of evidence behind it. Hey, Brian, just one quick just general question for all three programs. Do you feel like, is there a pretty good mix of like hard copy versus Digital, I mean, is there, we get a good balance here? Yes, and for the first year, again, which takes the price up a little bit, we'll purchase online and hard copy for everything the first year, um, which is, again, people in, in my positions have recommended, and then tease it out how the teachers use those materials. Um, and then for, for the second year, we would only buy replacement hard copy materials for things that we truly found that we needed, especially our primary kids. You're going to see that more, more frequently. I know Paul's going to get me for taking up so much time. It's important. Kelly normally goes off on there. So. Yeah. That's right. I'll keep reminding you Kelly. Issue. I have to keep reminding Kelly. I didn't spend much of my PI last year. I won't spend much <laughs> next year. We always have a pancake day to try to. <laughs> <laughs> he always does. I have to the numbers. That's right. All right. All right. Thank you so much. I just Thank wonder you. if there's any cost we could cut that. You know, for buying this, is there some other online reading or some other thing that we can draw? So that's, and that's all part of this. That's part of it, okay. Yeah, there's things that will be dropping off because we won't need it because of this program. So, and even like the 95% materials, um, we need that more heavy right now. And then as the years go on, we're going to be needing it less and less. So curriculum adoptions in our cycle right now is six years. Um, so some of those supports will be able to drop off as those six years go. And then just to reiterate too, if anybody, if any parents or anybody in the public wants to see hard copies of these materials, they will be available in the middle school and elementary yes. offices? Yes. Okay. I will say there's more information in the online links okay. than there are even in the hard, hard copy, but all are available. Very good. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, teachers yep. and staff for putting that all together. Well, thank you so much for all the staff that came. And this was not required. They, they volunteered to be here. So thank you for that. Um, the only thing I want to mention under discussion items, we don't need a board action on it. It's really just handled through the uh, notice uh, process that we follow for board meetings. Uh, but we would like to host the April board meeting at the Career Center. So they've agreed to host us. It's uh, the month we wanted to do um, a, uh, uh, an update about our Career Center. Um, Tom, you're our representative, you know, long serving, you know, <laughs> two and a half months in. Um, any, any feedback or any information on that? I'll find out more tomorrow. Okay. We have our meeting tomorrow. Very good. So, um, so we'll be, uh, the April meeting will be normal time, but at the career center. 
Um, can you find out, Tom, if we can get a um, site visit yeah, tour. tour through there as well? Yep. So we may need to adjust the time a little bit to a lot for that. Okay. Very I'll good. call you by tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, do we have any public comments on the agenda? Yeah, at this time. Right. And we do not have executive session tonight. I just need a motion to adjourn the meeting. I make a motion to adjourn. I have a second. Roll call. Mr. Yes. 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 Yes.